Even as Semmelweis, not a disease, he's a person, an OBGYN. And I'm looking out in the audience, and I, and I see some moms here. Did anybody have their, their baby delivered by Dr. Semmelweis? Anybody? Hmm, I didn't think so, because he was actually an OBGYN back in 1841, working in a Vienna hospital. And he came up with a radical theory for the time. He said that doctors should wash their hands in between patients. You see, at the time, doctors sometimes would work with 20 and 25 patients at a time during the day without washing their hands in between. Semmelweis instructed all of his interns to wash their hands in a chlorinated lime solution in between patients. See, he'd observed that the mortality rate in his hospital was three times that, that rate when, when mothers delivered with midwives at home. So after he did that, the mortality rate in his hospital plummeted. And he was so proud, he published his results in, in the medical journals that day. But people didn't accept that. The doctors of the day didn't accept that. They could look at their hands and clearly see that there was nothing on there that would make anybody sick. In fact, the controversy over hand washing uh, be became so contentious that Semmelweis was dismissed from his position. And ultimately, the medical establishment prevailed on his family to put him in an asylum because the man was obviously crazy, imagining that invisible organisms on your hand could actually make people sick. In the asylum, he actually died two weeks later, ironically, of a staph infection. And it wasn't until years after his death that someone named Louis Pasteur confirmed what we know today as germ theory. Now, Simmelweis was an empirical thinker. Data drove his decisions. The doctors of the day, they were intuitive thinkers. They could look at their hands and intuitively tell there was nothing on there that would make anybody sick. So they didn't, didn't do that. Now today, doctors wash their hands. Surgeons wash their hands. There is no surgeon today that says, I don't think I need to scrub up before surgery. They do it by rule. And that's why the subtitle of my book is why rules trump reason on Wall Street. You see, today, an awful lot of investors are intuitive thinkers. They make their decisions just based on intuition. They don't, they don't make data-driven decisions. But it's not just investors. It's portfolio managers, it's financial planners, <clears throat> it's, it's financial analysts. Now, we're going to talk about some very typical thinking errors. They're called availability, recency, extreme predictions, and also the gambler's fallacy. I'd like everybody in the room to think of three dead presidents. Don't say, out, say their names, but just think of three dead presidents. I'm going to try to guess who you're thinking of. OK, you got them? OK. Rutherford B. Hayes, Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland. Did I get them right? I was laughing. OK. Well, let, let me try this. Anybody think of these guys? Being in Virginia, if I threw in Thomas Jefferson, I think I'd get everybody in the room, wouldn't I? And here's the thing. This is what we call the availability error. When I ask you to think of, 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 of presidents, you automatically think of people like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. These presidents are much, much more available in your conscious mind. Now, you guys think intuitively. We all, by our very nature, think intuitively. That's the way we, you know, we, we, we've learned to think. That's the way our, our Stone Age brain has, been, has learned to think, is, is intuitively. But when you think this way, what happens is certain factors are considered and certain factors aren't considered. And those factors that are considered weigh much heavier. If I said to you, think of an animal that begins with an E, how many people would say emu? Everybody thinks of an elephant, right? Let me show you how this affects you on Wall Street. Go back to March of 2000. What was in the media? It was technology, technology, technology. 
JDS Uniphase, Cisco Systems, Sun Microsystems, the new economy. It wasn't just what people were talking about, it was all over the news. Smart Money Magazine, Smart Money Magazine, March of 2000. 15 great tech stocks you have to buy now. What's next for the market's hottest sector? Everybody remember this? In here it actually says, these are 15 great stocks that will light a fire under your portfolio. Well, if you bought them, it did, because it burned up your portfolio. They're all down 75%. Some are down 98%. Now, let's talk about new technology. Let's talk about radio. Let's talk about television, lasers, automobiles, railroads. They were all new technology at once. There were over 300 car companies in the United States in the 1920s. What if your great-grandfather had been, been smart enough to pick the winners and buy you those stocks? He could have bought you Ford and Chrysler and General Motors. You see, the record was clear. Investing in new technology is not an easy way to stock market riches. But people didn't pay attention to that. They made the availability error. This is my best fishing buddy. And I took my daughter Abigail, who's right here in front of me, uh, and I took her out fishing about, uh, about six weeks ago, and she caught that little catfish there that you can see. Now, when we were fishing, we were fishing with, uh, with Captain Mike, and let me tell you something. Captain Mike can tell some fishing stories. You were hearing about 30 pounders here and 40 pounders here, and he was on and on and on about the, the, these stories. Now, I'm sitting here, I've been fishing for a long time, and most of the fish in the James I caught kind of looked like that one. And I'm saying to myself, oh, come on, Mike, come on, You're, this is an impressionable nine-year-old girl, stop with the fishing stories. Just then, Abigail's pole goes like this. And the line goes, err, err, err. And she grabs the pole and she pulls back and she starts reeling in. And 10 minutes later, we pulled this out of the water. A 35-pound blue catfish. She reeled it in all by herself. And I'm talking about what we call recency. The next time we went fishing, what do you think she was talking about? I mean, all she heard from Captain Mike was about these huge, giant catfish. And, oops, went forward too fast. And all she heard from Captain Mike was about these huge, giant catfish. And all she was talking about was, you know, 30, 40 pound catfish. So, recency. Let me show you how that affects you uh, on, on Wall Street. And we got, nine, we got 100 years of the stock market averaging about 9% a year. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand if they sold out earlier in this year. But if you know somebody that sold stocks earlier in this year, raise your hand. Okay? Just about everybody knows somebody that sold out earlier this year. That was the recency error because all you heard was very, very negative stuff. So the, the, the stuff that you're hearing uh, recently weighed much heavier than the stuff that, that um, you, you'd heard in the past. 